Muchas gracias, señora Alborn. Ha sido muy interesante su propuesta. Esperamos verla próximamente en ejecución. Es la expectativa de toda esta gran sala que ha escuchado con mucho interés su presentación. Muchas gracias. Ahora da daremos la palabra al, al señor Sashi Berma, como me he referido antes, es el director de la Oficina de Tecnología y Experiencia del Viajero en Transport for London, uno de los mayores, ma mayores organismos de transporte público en Europa, moviendo 31 millones de viajeros eh, cada día y que nos contará cuál es la visión de futuro que tienen para la movilidad de estos viajeros. So after some very interesting slides, I'm not going to bore you with more slides. Um, what Pear asked me to do is to tell you the story of what's happening in London. And I'm going to just tell you a very simple story about what's going on here. Many of you have undoubtedly been to London. And even if you have not, I'm sure you've heard about what's going on in London and has been going on for a long time. We are um, one of the most ancient cities around in the world, been around for 2,000 years. But remarkably, we've also been a city that's been very innovative when it comes to transport. The first bus service ran in London in 1829. That's almost 200 years ago. And these were horse-drawn buses. There were no internal combustion engines back then. Remarkably, the first underground railway line uh, is now 154 years old. It's the first railway line in London underground ran in 1863. And in fact, in 2013, just four years ago, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of the original railway line opening in London. And after a long, long time, we ran a steam train in the tunnels again. And I'll tell you, I was on the steam train. One steam train created enough smoke and smog inside the tunnels. You only have to wonder what it is that people were dealing with when there were trains running in both directions every five minutes in the same tunnels. And so on and so on. But compared to the transport system in London, the organization that runs the transport is relatively new. Transport for London was created as an integrated transport organization only in 2000, so only about 17 years ago. And that's the story that's worth telling today. It's not the story of the fact that London has a lot of transport. Everybody knows that. But what's been achieved by the creation of Transport for London is the remarkable story. For a long time, um, you know, between sort of 1950 to 2000, uh, London went through a period when there, there was very significant invest in, investment in transport, but unfortunately not enough. And by the end of that period, uh, the transport system in London was looking positively in poor shape. Buses were very old. Uh, the tube system had not been maintained properly for a long time, and therefore the tube was not very reliable. And these were common complaints that Londoners had about the transport system not that long ago. So I've lived in London since 1999, and I do remember when I arrived in London, the transport system was better than anything I had experienced anywhere in the world, but not fit enough to rely upon if you had to rely upon it every day. So the creation of Transport for London in 2000 was a grand experiment, because what it did is it brought 14 organizations together, each of which had been responsible for a little bit of the transport system. The largest of which was an organization called London Transport that ran the tube and the buses. But there were other organizations responsible for maintaining the roads, for managing the traffic, for licensing the taxis, for licensing the riverboat service, for running our, uh, our coach station where intercity buses operate from, and so on. I have gone back to look for what it is that people were thinking when they created this organization. You know, what was the thought process? And, um, Although there was some thought about why it was important to create this transport organization, you have to say there was a little bit of an accident involved in creating uh, what is now the most integrated transport organization. And this integration has allowed a lot of good things to happen in London that simply would not have happened otherwise. So take a few examples. Anyone who's been to London knows that we suffer from very poor traffic congestion. And radical action is therefore needed to do something about the, the traffic. But typically, in most cities, uh, traffic is managed by one entity. The roads are managed by typically a different entity. Buses are operated by a third entity. And it's very difficult for these organizations to talk to each other. In London, 
because all three of those activities are being done in one place, that was one of the major reasons why the congestion charge came to be. The congestion charge was launched in 2003 and has been in force since then. And it requires anyone who wants to drive in London to pay a tariff. It's, it's a, it's, it is a congestion charge. It's 12 pounds these days. Just to drive in central London, just to enter or leave central London, you have to pay 12 pounds for that privilege. Immediately, when the charge was uh, started in 2003, traffic levels dropped by about 20%. The traffic became faster. That's obviously a good thing for everyone who uses the road network. But the principal user of the road network is the bus system. So the buses became faster, and that's where a lot of the cost saving in running the transport system came from. Now think about this. Uh, you know, we're a city of 8.8 .8 million today. 15 years ago, we were a city of 7.3 million. So London is growing every year. And our biggest challenge is we need to keep fitting more and more people into the same land, into the same road space, into the same transport infrastructure, unless we can expand the transport infrastructure. So doing things of this kind uh, encourages the efficiency with which the transport network is used. Every car that's taken off the roads and replaced by a bus increases the number of people who can use the same road space by a factor of about 50. And therefore, having an efficient bus service was important. So these things came about as a result of um, the, the creation of an integrated transport body. And in, in fact, the one thing that I say to every city around the world is that the one mistake you can make, and the one mistake that you should make, is just integrate your transport system. The more fragmentation you have in the transport system, the more ability there is for people to argue about things that should not have any argument about them. And cities that have gone um, in the direction of integrating the transport system have usually done quite well. So that's, that institutional story about the success of London is really important. The second thing that happened in London, which has really changed our mindset, is um, if, you, if you look at London Transport, which was the largest of our uh, predecessor organizations, and compared it with Transport for London, one of the big differences is what is the organization there to do? And if you ask people who worked for London Transport 20 years ago, the answer would have been, we're here to run trains and buses. Well, the answer that you get from Transport for London today is very different. Our job is to keep the city moving and to make life in London better. We know that we exist in a very competitive world. People who, have, who make the choice to come and live in London also have the choice to go and live in Paris or in Hong Kong or in Singapore or indeed anywhere else. And therefore, to attract talent into London, we have to make sure that the quality of service that we are able to uh, provide in London and the quality of life that people can then get in London is as good as possible. It's never going to be the best experience you can have. You can have a great experience living in Barcelona, for example. But London is London. It's a city that's growing. It's a city that's very dense. It's very crowded. And we have to provide the best uh, living experience within those constraints. The reason this came about is we were making the case for um, a big railway investment, Crossrail, which is about to uh, start service next year. And it forced us very hard to think, if you're going to ask for investment in a major railway project, what is that investment there to do? And the traditional answer within the transport community has been that you create a business case with the benefits in that business case being defined by time savings. As we all know, railways don't make money. And therefore, uh, there has been this tradition for about 50 years now of trying to make transport business cases on the basis of time savings. And then you divide that by the cost, gives you a benefit cost ratio. If you have a good benefit cost ratio, you go straight to the government to ask for investment. Unfortunately, that doesn't work all the time. It certainly doesn't work if you're asking for very large amounts of investment. And the, if you look at Crossrail, that's a 15 billion pound project, 20 billion euros, a single project, 20 billion euros. It's among the biggest projects you can think about in the whole world. It's in the course of looking at Crossrail that we realized that actually what we are worried about is not time savings. What we are worried about is how do we make the London economy more productive? And there's good economic theory, much of which developed uh, either by us or by economists working at our behest, that says that density encourages productivity. That's why cities exist. Cities exist because they create um, 
more fluid and more, uh, more closer economic interactions than you would get by just spreading people across the whole country. And if that's the case, then encouraging density is a very big part of what transport organizations ought to be doing. But if density is the core aim of transport, then our job is not to think about trains or buses or taxis or cars. Our job is to think about how to make the city run as efficiently as possible, using all the means at our disposal, which includes trains and buses and taxis and cars and everything else. It also includes freight movement inside the city. That resulted in a fundamental change to what this organization is there to do. As I say, our objective is to keep London moving and growing and to make life in London better, which is not an objective that you would hear a transport organization propound, but that is what we're there to do. But you push that further. If it is about making life in London better, how do you improve the quality of the experience that people have? Uh, clearly, providing a transport service is important. Making it reliable is important. But there are many other things that cause a hassle in the use of public transport. So once you've got past the, uh, the basic hygiene issues of the transport service being there and being reliable and being clean and safe and so on, you get to two quite important ingredients of things that people see as an impediment to using public transport. The first is having information about the transport system, knowing where the buses go, but also in real time, if you're at a bus stop, knowing how far away your bus is. This is all uh, you know, things that have happened in the last 10 years. But we have to cast our mind back to say 10 years ago, uh, real-time information about buses was not available. It's all come about in the last 10 years. And there is still a lot to do in making sure that that information is not just available in real time, but it's also predictive. It's also more accurate. It's also more user-friendly. And there's a lot that's happening on that front even today. The second major impediment that people see is payments. Most of us are here in Barcelona in a new city. Go to any new city around the world, and the first thing that is an impediment to using the transport system is how do I get a ticket here? It is a genuine problem, and especially if you're in a city where you don't speak the language. Um, I have a friend who went to Athens, you know, nice, beautiful city with a very good transport system, but when you encounter the ticket machine, it's in Greek. And as they say, it's all Greek. And that's a real problem. We had a fantastic ticketing system in London with the Oyster Card, which I've now run for many, many years. And as a Londoner, it's a very convenient system to use. But if you're not from London, your first challenge is to go and acquire an Oyster Card. You have to queue up somewhere to get an Oyster Card, top it up with money, use the card as you go along. And then at the end of the, uh, your two or three or five days a week in London, you're left with this Oyster Card with a bit of money on it. That's a common experience as well. Happens in every city around the world. Now I'll tell you, if you go to a coffee shop in London, they don't make you buy a card. They don't make you top it up. And when you're finished with your coffee, you're not left with this card with some money on it, not knowing what to do with it. So the challenge that we had, the challenge that we posed to ourselves, is how do we take the hassle out of ticketing completely from the system? And over the last 10 years, um, we've put in place, and we've led the global movement on putting contactless payments on our transport system. So today, in London, if you have a contactless bank card, and you'll know if you have one, if you have a contactless bank card, you do not need to buy a ticket. You get off the plane at Heathrow, get your credit card or your debit card out, and you can start traveling right there and then. There's no need to buy a ticket, no need to get an Oyster card, no need to interact with us at all. The experience of using transport has become one that's very similar to the experience of using or buying anything else. It's been a huge success in the, uh, in the very short time that it's been live on our system. We went live on buses in 2012, went live on the tube in 2014. And in the three years that we've been live on the tube, half of our journeys are now being made using a contactless bank card. And that's not just visitors, it's also Londoners who are choosing to switch from Oyster to contactless because they don't need to get a card, they don't need to keep it topped up, they don't run out of money, they don't have any of those hassles. Uh, 28 million people have used a contactless bank card on our system in the last three years, and they come from 120 countries around the world. So pretty much every country that has issued a card of this kind, we've seen them. 
it's little things of this kind that are actually not that little in the real, uh, in the real scheme of life that make the experience of using a transport system more attractive. That is what brings new people onto the transport system every day. Now, I'll tell you, every day we see uh, new users of contactless cards on our system. We can count them because they leave such a nice electronic trace behind them that we can count them. I was just looking at data this morning because uh, last week's data came in. 40,000 new contactless cards are seen on our system every day. 40,000 new customers on our system every day, many of whom are visitors. But these are 40,000 people who otherwise would have been joining a queue to buy a ticket somewhere else. So starting from the sort of mega issues of how to join up transport with institutions, to changing the purpose for which the organization lives, to looking after the user experience and the customer experience, this is what we do. Now the big challenge going, going into the future is London is continuing to grow we're still adding 100,000 people to our population every year. And there are no new roads in London, and a new road is not about to be built. So the challenge of fitting more people into the same city is not going away. And that's going to be the case in the future as well. The mayor has just published a draft transport strategy. It is going to get, it's under consultation right now and should get finalized next year. The draft transport strategy looks out into the future. By 2031, the, the city is going to have 10 million people, not 8.8 point, uh, 8 .8 million as we have today. So what do we do to keep the city running with 10 million people? Clearly, getting control over traffic is important, because with more, no more new roads, we need to make sure that the, the roads can keep flowing and that all this new traffic is going to go somewhere else. So the mayor has set out a very bold agenda 34% of traffic today on the, um, in London is by car or by private vehicle. And the mayor has challenged us to produce policies that will reduce that to 20%. So in a city that's growing, the number of car trips have to shrink, and they have to shrink very radically. It's not a small change um, to, to car traffic. And that also means getting the public transport system geared up to, to be able to deal with that traffic. The second thing is, again, quality of life is important, and air quality has become a huge issue. London doesn't suffer from some of the pollution issues that, uh, that cities in, in Asia or in the developing world face. But there is no doubt that London also suffers from poor air quality, and the mayor has put that very firmly on the agenda for something that needs to be solved. A lot of the pollutants in the air in London come from the transport system. There are, of course, other sources of pollutants as well. Uh, but the challenge of tackling air pollution from transport is very firmly now on the agenda in London. And it's things of this kind, being able to give people a good experience, making sure the city remains productive and attractive for employers to come and, uh, come and settle themselves in, and providing good health and transport outcomes are the things that are going to make the transport system fit for the future and a London, a competitive city to work in. That's the agenda that we are in. That's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you.